to catch all four speakers. So today, um, first, thanks for joining this panel and this conference is incredibly important. In this panel, you'll hear from four speakers, each talking about gang prosecutions by allegedly progressive prosecutors in East Coast jurisdictions. Baltimore, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, and then Southern District of New York, a Bronx prosecution. So we'll be working our way up the East Coast. Um, each panelist will take 10 minutes, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. You can drop your questions and answers in, uh, questions into the chat during the speaker's talk, but we'll let all four uh, finish their comments and then we'll have a general discussion in this space, hopefully for, um, you know, at least a half an hour, maybe closer to 40 minutes. And then we can all uh, go to a Kumo space if we want to keep talking. Um, I am going to let each panelist introduce them, him or herself or themselves. Um, we'll start with Farid Nasor Hayat. Farid, take it away. Um, greetings, everyone. Again, Farid Nasor Hayat. Um, I am a former public defender. I was born and raised in South Los Angeles um, in a space where uh, gang banging and gang life was something that I uh, very much desired to do and um, tried to dabble in as a child. As a public defender and representative of the indigent, I have um, litigated gang prosecution cases and um, have learned a lot from that. I'm going to talk about uh, my experience as a criminal defense attorney, specifically litigating like, one of the largest gang prosecution cases in Baltimore city history um, against the Black Guerrilla family. And um, specifically, Baltimore City is an interesting place because the prosecutor is Marilyn Mosby, who for all intents and purposes qualifies as what we label as a progressive prosecutor. Um, I, I often tell people she makes it hard for me to continue to dislike all prosecutors sometimes because she keeps finding finding a way to like really surprise me um, with doing things that are truly progressive. As it relates to gang prosecution, she is lagging behind. And I'm gonna highlight some specific ways in which the prosecution of um, those accused as gang members uh, occur in Baltimore City and some of the specific legal problems, constitutional challenges that can be brought to those type of prosecutions. Um, I'm going to share PowerPoint. I'm very wordy, so you don't have to read every word. It really is like more of a, a guide for myself, but you know, um, some sometimes there's some helpful information on there as well. So um, you can keep your eye on it, but it's certainly not necessary for you to follow word for word with it. Um, so I guess I should have started at the beginning. <laughs> share this again. There we go. All right, so gang prosecution and uh, ethical prosecutors. And I use the word ethical because I think that everybody is throwing themselves under this title of progressive and it's a moving space. But if you are intending to actually follow the law, if you're intending to do that which is just, I think you fall more in the category of ethical. And if you are attempting to be ethical, I believe um, prosecutors can do some specific things. We all know this information, so I won't spend much time, but 90% of the people in gang databases are black or brown, while 25% of gang members are white. Um, white nationalist street gangs are not um, policed or prosecuted under gang statutes essentially at all. Um, and in Mississippi in particular, 100% of the people arrested under gang statute laws between 2010 and 2017 were black, despite Mississippi's own Association of Gang Investigators saying that 53% of verified gang members are white. Gang statutes are racist. They are, what I argue, badges of slavery. Gang statutes should be abolished because they're badges of slavery and they further white supremacy and are almost exclusively used against black and brown individuals. What are some of the specific dangers of gang prosecutions? Well, number one, evidence that would be otherwise irrelevant and inadmissible comes in the trial. Generally, very inflammatory details about gang activities, even if the de defendant is not involved in those particular activities, are admissible. Um, gang prosecutions often use these police officers, who they would like to call experts, to really like tell you what's going on inside an individual's mind and uh, oftentimes address the ultimate question, answering the ultimate question, is this person a gang member? Using um, psychology and sociology that many times they're just completely unqualified to articulate. 
And then finally, another um, very fundamental violation of constitutional rights that gang prosecutions create, and that's the violation of double jeopardy. And I'll talk about these three things in turn. And I'm talking about these three things in particular because it comes from my trial experience. These are the things that um, made the evidence in this gang case insurmountable. I couldn't put forth a credible defense because of these um, pathways to guilty findings that prosecutors have through gang statutes. What can ethical prosecutors do? Number one, don't bring gang charges. And Chase Bodine started off by saying, hey, you know, I'm not bringing any of these enhancements. And as we know, California largely focuses on the enhancements, but they're jurisdictions that both have substantive gang charges and enhancements charges. The state of Maryland actually has a substantive gang charge where you can be convicted for a crime in furtherance of the gang. So don't bring those charges. Bring substantive crimes if they're legitimate. Where gang charges are brought, what can prosecutors do? Number one, they can bifurcate from trial from the substantive crime and, uh, um, and not bring that enhancement or substantive charge with the gang charge. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about it a little bit, but that means that keep the gang charge information separate from proving if my client committed a robbery or if my client committed a murder. First prove that before you get into the details of what this gang may do across the city. Another thing is, do not introduce expert witnesses that offer sociological and psychological evidence that is based on flawed methodology. And avoid defendants' double jeopardy um, violations. Do not charge a person with a gang statute where there's only one predicate act. And I say that because, again, if you're charged with a, a, a substantive gang charge of distribution of cocaine, and you're charged with that distribution of cocaine, you found not guilty of distribution of cocaine, but guilty of distribution of cocaine while a gang member. Impossible. It's the same offense. If you didn't do it as an individual, you couldn't have done it as a gang member. So don't bring those kind of charges, and gang statutes allow prosecutors to bring those. And then finally, merge these gang charges with the conspiracy charges. And we have case law that supports this concept that these gang uh, statute violations are the same offense as um, conspiracies. Ethical prosecutors should consent to bifurcation. I'll highlight an example. Gang statutes allow the prosecutor to tell a jury about crimes unrelated to the actual defendant. An example. Um, in my case, a client was accused of murder. The prosecutor declined to originally bring that murder charge. Um, but once the gang statute was passed, that prosecutor brought that exact same gang charge, even though it was insufficient evidence, and not only did they bring the charge under the gang statute, they were able to get a conviction. Why? Well, because the prosecutor was able to talk about multiple murders within that Greenmont area of Baltimore that was unrelated to that defendant, not actually a part of that trial, but in order to prove that the gang commits a series of crimes, they're able to talk about crimes that are not on trial that day and oftentimes put the defendant in a very difficult place to challenge evidence that they don't have, but more importantly, challenge hearsay of witnesses that won't even be there. You often will just have officers talk about the general condition of the neighborhood where they don't actually have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that those crimes actually occur. Um, so, um, and gang evidence is impermissible propensity evidence. Essentially, a defendant is up against proving that the gang isn't that bad as opposed to proving I did not commit this particular crime. The answer is to bifurcate. We have uh, um, law under the Monell on civil law that says that if the underlying crime was not caused, uh, did not occur, what maybe caused the crime did not happen. Meaning that if a murder did not occur, meaning I did not commit a murder, so what if I'm a gang member? Or so what if gangs were involved? Prove the murder first. So bifurcation prevents overwhelming juries. Um, if there's nothing illegal be about being a gang, then gang membership shouldn't be considered a crime. Bifurcation helps ensure any conviction is based on beyond a reasonable doubt of the actual crime. And ethical prosecutors will decline to use evidence that doesn't go to the substantive crime that is only about bad character evidence. 
ethical prosecutors should not bring gang expert testimony in trials. Gang experts require normally somewhere between, they have about 10 different um, signs or indications of gang memberships. And most of them say anywhere between two or three of these indicators will qualify a person as a gang. The problem is that once you put these kind of um, tests under a microscope, they fall apart. In my particular case, the gang expert testified that if you had two of the 10 predictors, then you would be a gang member. He said that throwing up signs and associations with gang members qualify one as a gang uh, member. Well, I asked him, if your cousins are gang members and you hang out with them, yes, and you throw up this sign in particular, would that qualify? He says, no. I said, well, isn't this a gang sign? He says, yes, that's what the BGF put up. So two of the qualities, hanging out with gang members and using the BGF sign did not add up to gang membership. But this concept that that expert gets to decide these kind of things and equally important about what, what does it really mean to hang out with family members or to hang out with community members or to use particular signs and the fact that that evidence becomes so prejudicial and not credible. Their methods have never been accepted uh, in relevant scientific communities, but they use psychology. They say, well, this is why gang members do this. This is how gang culture works. That's called uh, sociology. That's called psychology. And those actually have people with degrees and have studied and actually can provide research and statistics to support their opinions. While gang experts just say, hey, I know it because I know it. Well, how do you test that? You can't test it. Um, yet juries credit this testimony of these experts simply because they're police officers and they create this sense of infallibility that we should believe them because they're police and well, they've arrested 5,000 gang members. Well, how do we know that these arrests are based in truth, that they're reliable, that they're consistent, that they're using the same standards or that we should rely on? We don't. Ethical prosecutors should not use gang experts. They can have people testify to what they see occur but limit the ability to talk about what goes on in a person's mind or what two and two adds up to, you don't necessarily know. Um, and why is this such a big deal? There's um, a former prosecutor, Alan Jackson, in his article, Prosecuting the Gang Case, What Local Prosecutors Need to Know, he wrote the easiest way to get gang evidence admitted in the trial is by filing a substantive gang charge or enhancement. Once that charge and enhancement is filed, everything that the gang expert knows becomes relevant to the gang charge. So essentially, if you add a gang charge, then that expert can talk about everything in the neighborhood, even if it had nothing to do with the defendant. And why do we do that? We want to overwhelm the jury. Finally, um, one, an, um, a third way in which gang prosecutions violate constitutional rights and the ways in which ethical prosecutors can elect not to bring is these double jeopardy violations. We know that classic double jeopardy or successive prosecution is when one is already tried for uh, an act and jeopardy attached. Or collateral estoppel is when you relitigate an issue that's already been decided by a jury. And then simultaneous double jeopardy, we've talked about that a little bit, if you're charged with drug dealing and then charged with drug dealing on behalf of the gang, meaning you're gonna be punished for that same instance of drug dealing on two occasions that happen on the exact same time. Let's talk about collateral estoppel in particular. I won't go through the other two, but as it relates to collateral estoppel, the uh, seminal case is Ash v. Swenson, and Ash held that once an issue of ultimate fact has been determined, by a ballot and final judgment, that issue cannot be relitigated. Oh, guess what gang statutes allow? Um, client found um, charged with distribution of drugs, has a jury trial found not guilty of distribution of drugs. One year later, he's charged under the gang statute for that exact incident of distribution of drugs and then found guilty. That's a violation of double jeopardy and specifically the uh, uh, legal doctrine of uh, Ashby Swenson. If he did not distribute drugs on that first occasion, he could not have distributed drugs on behalf of um, the Black Gorilla family. It's a violation of double jeopardy. Ethical prosecutors will not intentionally violate the Constitution. So like, Lad, uh, like Ash, if he did not distribute cocaine, he could not have to distribute it in furtherance of the gang. Ethical prosecutors should reject Fifth Amendment violations. So my conclusion, Ethical prosecutors uh, have a responsibility to uphold the Constitution. 
ethical prosecutors should reject prosecutions entirely. They're badges of slavery, born of racialized myths of violence and function to overpunish black and brown men, alleged crimes. Ethical prosecutors should continue to uh, who continue to bring gang charges should bifurcate them from the substantive charge, not call gang experts, and refrain from bringing previously adjudicated conduct. Thank you. Thanks, Farid. Uh, Meredith Manchester? Hi, my name is Meredith, um, and I'm an attorney at the Defender Association of Philadelphia, which is the public defender's office in Philadelphia. However, my views are my own and should not be attributed to that of my organization. Um, as many of you probably know, in Philadelphia, our district attorney is Larry Krasner, and he's one of the most well-known um, individuals who have run on this platform of progressive prosecution, promising that um, incarceration should be will be used as a last resort, that it will only be used to um, be used with the most violent offenders. And that sounds reasonable, right? It might even sound progressive until you look at who he is allowing his office to identify as the most violent offenders. I could probably waste my whole time talking about that specifically, but I'll do my best to keep my comments limited to what we're here to talk about today, which is regarding gang allegations and group affiliations. And so I've been researching group violence initiatives in Philadelphia for the last five years. Krasner took office in 2018, so just a few years ago. So I'm gonna talk about what I've seen under his administration. And recently it's been just the same as it was before Krasner. And so the first couple years of his administration, we didn't see it so much in the courtroom. We weren't seeing the same kind of testimony brought by officers that had been brought in the past. Um, but then last fall, it started popping up again in the same exact manner. And so what would happen, there are basically three, um, three steps that, that wind up with the same result of, the cop, of a cop coming in to testify at bail revocation motions, at preliminary arraignments, at sentencing, and the like. The district attorney using their arguments and their you know, facts in argument um, and also using them in plea negotiations. So the first step is identify, right? How do we identify the individuals who we're going to target as affiliated with group violence? And important to note is that they use the word group, right? They don't use the word gang. They don't use a statutory definition. And this is to avoid any kind of criteria, any kind of definition that they have to meet. How do you prove someone's in a gang? How do you prove that they're not in, or sorry, in a group? How would you ever prove that they're not in a group, right? It's a very loosey-goosey word. But using that word, they're still able to evoke the kind of fear um, that the word gang would evoke in a courtroom. And so they basically get the, both, the best of both worlds. Um, and so in order to identify an individual as part of a group, they have basically boiled down to they've criminalized friendship. If they identify a young adult black male that is friends with other young adult black males in a particular geographic location within a couple blocks, those individuals are automatically labeled as in a group and those affiliations will often come into court. And so I wanted to, uh, sorry. And so the second, um, the second pro part of this process would be the harassment aspect, right? Once these cops have identified the people that they're saying are in a group, you can only imagine the kind of harassment that they're doing to get these individuals into court. And once they get into court, unfortunately, because we all know that trials don't happen right away, right? They have a long amount of time that the court has supervision over these individuals before they would ever have to prove any kind of case at trial. And so it's not at the trial at level that these affiliations are coming in. As I mentioned before, it's a lot of pretrial supervision um, hearings, like bail hearings, and then later on at sentencing. Um, and a lot of times the charges that they're actually charged with have nothing to do with any kind of gang affiliation. And then big issue that comes from that is if you listen to Fareed and talk about, if you listen to Fareed talk about the lack of evidence they would have even at trial, the inability they're able, the inability they have to meet rules of evidence at trial, imagine in a bail hearing where the rules of evidence are so much more lax, if even existent at all. Um, and so 
The third step is obviously testify, right? Once they get an individual in the door at the courtroom, the officers work with the district attorney's office to come and testify at these things, at these hearings. And then the district attorney's office uses it to argue to the judge that this individual should be treated differently than every other individual because they are a violent group member. And so I wanted to give you an example of one of the hearings that I've seen uh, that I saw last fall, um, and then talk about the conversation that I had with the officer after that. Um, and so right now, what I'm sharing is public record. It is notes of testimony from a bail revocation hearing. Give me one second. Okay. And this officer, his name is Officer Lamana. He's one of the officers that's been popping up most frequently in these types of hearings. And the individual that, or the client in this case, it was his first arrest. Um, as an adult, he had no prior record. He was working, he was going to school, he was on pretrial supervision, he had made bail. Um, and all of a sudden, when these initiatives started popping back up in court, the district attorney's office brought this bail verification motion, despite the fact that this individual had not violated pretrial conditions whatsoever. And so Officer Lamana took the stand. What he did was he listed off a number of shootings that had happened in that individual's neighborhood. And then he explained to the judge why he thought that this individual was a member of the group. And it boiled down to the fact that he had the number 58 in his social media handle, that he had group photos with other individuals he thought were involved in the, in the 58 group. I don't exactly remember what he said they were called. And then he was, my client, the client was friends with an individual who had been shot and murdered, who also happened to be his cousin. And so the officer used this, as well as the district attorney, to argue that this individual was violent, a danger to the community, and needed to be locked up. And he got what he wanted, right? He, the judge ended up did, ended up locking up this individual and did not let him out on house arrest until he could show that he had an address to live at that was outside of the neighborhood where his family lived. And, and so I spoke to this officer after after court, I sat in the back, waited for him to come back to try to figure out, you know, more of what his mentality was, what um, his perspective, his overall perspective was. And the first question I asked him, I, I was like, hey, how do you know, why do you think these shootings were group related? Like, is it just because they occurred in these neighborhoods or what? He said, I never said those shootings were group related. Like, well, you just testified for this individual's bail revocation hearing that he needed locked up because he was involved in a group that's involved in these shootings. He's like, no, I didn't say that. I was just listing them off. Um, and they happened in his neighborhood. So that means he's essentially, I'm probably not in these words, but that means he's dangerous. It's like, okay, well, you never suspected that this kid was involved in any violence before the alleged incident that he was charged for, right? He's not, you have no indication that he was involved in any violence between these groups that you were talking about nor that he has ever been alleged to involved in any criminal behavior, let alone violent criminal behavior before this first arrest. The officer, says, the officer said, yeah, but it doesn't matter what he did or what he didn't do. It matters what the individuals in his group did or are thought to have done and they're violent and therefore he needs locked up. So my third question was, okay, why do you think it is better to lock this kid up who had a job, who's doing well on pretrial supervision? Why do you think it's better to lock him up than to have him continue doing well in the community and actually work towards the kind of life that you would supposedly want him to live. And his response was that he thought that it was for his safety, the client's safety, and for the safety of the community. Social services don't matter, jobs don't matter, education doesn't matter. None of these soft things matter. The only thing matters is the neighborhood he lives in um, and that if he does not move, then he needs to be locked up. So my next question was, Okay, how do you avoid, if you were a young black male in the area where this client lived, how would you avoid being targeted by yourself? And he told me, he, at first he said, um, you know, I would just stay inside all the time. And then he thought about it and he's like, well, you know, that's not really feasible, so I guess I would move. The only way to avoid being targeted by myself would be to move. Because if you're in these neighborhoods and you're out hanging out with people in these neighborhoods, you are likely to get shot or shoot someone else. And so then finally I asked him how many targets was he stalking? How many people did he have on his list that he thought were group affiliated? He told me that he was following over a thousand people on social media, and that's just this one officer. And that the way he would follow people on social media 
or decide which you know accounts he was going to follow is he can find one and then see that these people were friends with these people and then use links in their social media pages to find other people so he'd be stalking these individuals and just keep adding to his list i asked him did he have an official list he wrote down or how did he document this information he told me he kept it all in his head this man has been doing this for several years. We have read several police reports recently um, where he's talked about following people on Instagram and their Twitter feeds, et cetera, for years before they're even alleged to have engaged in any kind of criminal activity. And so the main takeaway that I would hope you guys leave with is in Philadelphia, you do not need to be alleged to be involved in anything criminal in order to make it on the, on the police department's list of people they should target for being involved in group violence. Um, and so just to wrap up briefly, there has, you know, to be, to be candid, there has been a hiatus in these kind of um, hearings that we're seeing, but I largely think that that's probably due to COVID. One, as I'm sure happens, has been happening in a lot of jurisdictions is that there's been a lot less trials, a lot less things going on because of COVID. Another reason is because the district attorney's office stands on bail in regards to all of our clients. And so, the, you know, Mr. Krasner and what they put out to the public, they would like you to believe that they're trying to end cash bail so that only the most violent individuals are getting locked up and having to sit in custody pre-trial. However, the bail fund um, recently did a study and found that he's locked, he is requesting a million dollars bail on 53% of our clients. And these are not, and I can tell you from my own experience also, these are not for individuals who are, who have, necessarily have violent records who necessarily have violent charges pretty much run of the mill if you that they i'm sorry that unless there are really good mitigating circumstances that are present at the very time that you are arrested they request a million dollars bail and they're also having officers testify at preliminary arraignments where there is no record kept so we don't know what exactly these officers are saying but I know from the notes of prior of the public defenders who are representing at those hearings that they're also bringing these allegations at preliminary arraignments in order to secure higher bail. Um, and so for those reasons, I would guess at least contribute to the fact we've been seeing these hearings less recently. Um, but, you know, time will tell, but I would imagine that it's just going to pick up where it left off in the fall and that we'll keep seeing them and keep seeing, you know, friendship criminalized in Philadelphia. Thank you, Meredith. Nice job. MK, can you? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm MK Casey, and I'm Senior Policy Counsel with Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, our organization represents about 35,000 people charged with crimes and also in the uh, civil realm and family separation, immigration. And um, we provide those indigent services to many, many people every year in Brooklyn. Um, well, I am a public defender, but for the last year, my work has primarily been both city level policy work. Um, and work around policing, police misconduct, and gang prosecutions. Um, and obviously there's a huge intersection there between who the police feel that they can mistreat the most and groups that are othered in some way, in this case with the gang label. Um, the issues that we're tackling here in New York City have been uncovered largely through the work of advocates and activists, um, not through lawyers, um, you know, people who are impacted by gang policing and prosecutions, um, and then also people who have done the work of filing freedom of information requests because obviously neither prosecutors nor police are willing to have a high amount of transparency as, on these issues. Um, and those include members of the Gangs Coalition, which I'm proud to be a part of alongside Professor Howell and other speakers at this conference. As a public defender, we also get special insight into the ways that prosecutors build so-called gang cases against people, primarily black and brown people, and the way that these cases are built over the course of many years through surveillance and harassment by police. There are two critical and inseparable prongs to these cases, and those are police and prosecutors. So while we might be able to elect a so-called progressive prosecutor, the police departments that they're building their work on are all the same. Um, and they, they work together at every stage to criminalize association and to subvert the due process rights of accused people by othering them with gang labels. So I'll talk NYPD practices first. Um, obviously, they're inextricable. The way that the NYPD operates is probably familiar to people in other major metropolitan areas, notably LA and Chicago and Baltimore um, and Philadelphia. The NYPD maintains a secretive internal list called the criminal group database, also known as the gang database, in which the department labels almost exclusively young black and Latinx New Yorkers as gang members. Over 99% of the people in the database are non-white. 
Um, there is no, and that's according to the NYPD. So um, maybe even higher. There is no independent oversight of who is placed in this database. Individuals do not need to be convicted of any crime to be placed in it, not that that's an, a reliable metric anyway. And there's no way to challenge these gang designations. Criteria for designation include living in a known gang area and association with gang members, including family members. Um, the NYPD claims that people are not on this database for their lifetime, but there's no mechanism for ensuring that that's true. And there's frankly no reason to believe that they're telling the truth. And of course, as is often true in any moral panic, there's no clear definition of what it means to be a gang. And we end up with fear-driven policies that allow police and prosecutors to circumvent due process for gang-labeled people. Between 2003 and 2013, roughly a third of the people added to the database were children. Some of them were as young as 12 years old. And the NYPD continually expands the ways that someone can be added to their catalog. The database is also riddled with errors. So I personally represented people who are incorrectly identified as gang members. Perhaps a, a parent, their father, a brother, a sibling, a cousin is a gang member or is affiliated somehow, but this person is not. Um, but they're also misidentified. It's not just that they're including people who shouldn't be included, but they're mislabeling them um, as belonging to a certain group, which can actually be dangerous. More than one young person I've represented has reported to me that police will drive past their home and loudly tell them that they're in the wrong neighborhood, quote unquote, wrong neighborhood for a member of a certain group. And not only are the police wrong about this person's affiliation, but they're calling attention to this person and placing them at risk, which is something that they enjoy doing. So while they travel under the banner of public safety, they will often do things such as play diss tracks loudly from their squad cars while they roll through neighborhoods, taunt people with things that other gang members allegedly said online, I mean, other ways inflame tensions and then capitalize by being able to make arrests um, with young people. The NYPD also surveils children and young adults sometimes for years without ever alerting parents that their children are in trouble um, or offering meaningful interventions. Not that we'd want them to come from the police anyway, but we are spending resources one way or the other. Mass surveillance, such as through the domain awareness system and these types of covert gang operations, commands enormous budgetary expenses without measurable improvements in safety. Um, so this system, the domain awareness system, also known as DOS, and its functions and implications could be the topic of an entire conference. Um, but I just encourage you guys to check out some of this information from STOP, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. They have a lot of information about these methods of surveillance that are really interesting and, and terrifying, frankly. Um, but what's important to note here is that the NYPD, and therefore by extension, city prosecutors, uses DOS, the largest surveillance system in the world, as part of a public-private data partnership between Microsoft and the police to upload literally billions with a B of data points that track people's movements throughout New York City and beyond. And the only reason that we know so much about DOS is because the NYPD applied for a grant and had to brag about their program publicly, um, but prior to that, it was completely shrouded in secrecy, including by prosecutors during the discovery process. Um, police and prosecutors also scrape data from social media, listen to mu music, especially drill music, to prosecute people based on their lyrics, create fake accounts to glean information from people, um, and build social network maps using information that's available online and through DOS. We also know that the NYPD, and again, therefore city prosecutors, have access to technology that download all information from cell phones, including data stored remotely on apps without leaving a trace. Companies such as Cellbrite provide this technology to law enforcement. And because in New York City, we have administrative coded reporting requirements, we also know that the NYPD in 2020 alone, and this was a slow year, seized more than 55,000 cell phones and kept nearly half of them. So we know that they have the phones and they have the technology to access them without leaving a trace. We also know that prosecutors conspire with the NYPD to get phones that the NYPD has seized in unrelated or dismissed cases, and they then keep them to investigate matters if a person is of interest to them as a workaround to the warrant requirement. And we are especially seeing this so that they can build social network maps to build gang prosecutions. Now this level of surveillance and power that the NYPD has is not unique, but it's also something out of a dystopian nightmare, frankly. Um, and it's only made possible by the partnership and the legal authority granted to them by the prosecutors that they effectively work for. Um, I see a question that I actually will, will answer now. Are these phones seized and searched pursuant to a warrant? No. 
They are seized because every time a person is arrested, their phone gets vouchered. The NYPD is then able to keep it and then they access it without a warrant to our knowledge. They sometimes do not use this information in court, right? They, they're, therefore, there's no oversight. They're using it to build the gang database, to build their social network maps, to build the information that the NYPD and prosecutors have about a person. But because they don't need to introduce it as evidence in court, there's no real mechanism by which we're making sure that they're getting this information legally. Um, and there's obviously major collaboration, overlap, information sharing between the NYPD and prosecutors. Um, and this is where a discussion of prosecutorial practice is warranted. So certainly in New York City, as elsewhere, there are discussions about whether there even is such a thing as a progressive prosecutor. Um, and I know in the activist and public defense communities, there's significant disagreement over whether an abolitionist can even run for the office, given what the nature of the job is. Um, I think that's also warrants its own discussion. But what I will say here is that progressive is a term that's necessarily relative. So a a prosecutor might be progressive compared to their peers, but I don't know that this is a particularly useful or meaningful term because it can belie very typical prosecutorial behavior. So what I know working in Brooklyn is that I may get a better plea deal on certain charges than if I were to say like cross the bridge and go to Staten Island. But every district attorney in the five boroughs relies on the NYPD, facilitates their efforts at gang surveillance, and has a very tough time maintaining stated decarceral policies once someone is a labeled gang member by these racist and invasive practices, and once a gun is involved. Um, and I will say, based on our anecdotal evidence, um, as, pro as, as you know, these cases are prosecuted, that almost no gun is coming through arraignments or getting prosecuted without the gang label being involved. Um, because pretty much every young person that we represent here in Brooklyn is labeled as a gang, by, gang member by the NYPD. Um, now, New York State does not have gang enhancement sentencing rules. But these gang labels are raised at every opportunity to weaken what few due process protections exist in the criminal punishment system at all. Um, for example, reporters are tipped off by police and prosecutors to gang raids before defense counsel is notified. A person's alleged gang status is used when arguing, arguing about bail, even though New York has what's considered to be robust bail statutes, that information will still slip its way into a bail application because they're letting a judge know that if this person is released and is then implicated in future crimes, that judge will be on the cover of the New York Post. And so bail gets set in higher amounts. Um, discovery laws are circumvented. Prosecutors withhold critical information such as witness names, again, relying simply on an accused alleged affiliation as a reason to handicap the defense. Um, and even prosecutorial efforts at so-called alternatives to incarceration involve major input from the NYPD to the point that the department is able to veto individuals from eligibility for certain programs as alternatives to prison time based on what the police determine to be their likelihood to commit crimes in the future. Like the NYPD is doing precog work in order to ensure that young, young people are going upstate to prison rather than being granted alternatives to incarceration in prosecutor run programs. Um, victims of shooting are made ineligible from these prosecutor run programs because police and prosecutors say that victims are more likely to become shooters. New York City also funds our version of Operation Ceasefire, which is purported to provide resources to at risk youth, but is actually run by federal and state prosecutors, the ATF and the NYPD. Um, and those tactics that this Operation Ceasefire uses include sending threatening letters to people identified as gang members, threatening to get the NYPD involved in their sentencing, um, and unannounced home visits by police to people who are gang, deemed gang affiliated, which brings unwanted attention to them is obviously embarrassing, um, but can also create additional risks. Um, and there are also workarounds to the lack of gang enhancements here in New York. So police identified gang members are targeted for harassment and abuse by the police. They're then charged with inchoate or planning crimes and crime by association and brought down in gang conspiracy charges um, rather than the commission of specific acts, which is something that both other speakers have talked about today. Um, and then they're warehoused for complex prosecutions. And these prosecutions, even those by the most quote unquote progressive DAs are built on the racist and classist work of gang policing. They rely on racist assumptions about the rights of gang labeled people and they damage communities and young people for life. So gang policing criminalizes affiliation with friends, relatives, and neighbors without achieving community safety. And this practice is costly both in terms of human and fiscal terms. Um, and prosecutors provide the scaffolding for all of this to happen before anyone even sets foot in a courtroom. 
Um, so I'm just going to end on this. You know, in, in December 2020, the Center for Court Innovation released a groundbreaking report. It was called You've Got to Make Your Own Heaven. Um, and the report details the experiences of 330 young New Yorkers, their experiences with guns, violence, safety, gangs, and the police. Um, this remarkable study provides a unique firsthand perspective into the lives of young people and the challenges they face here in NYC. Um, and strikingly, the hundreds of young people interviewed consistently identified threats from the police as a reason to carry a gun or seek protection within a crew. They identified violent victimization by police, police harassment for small infractions, but lack of responsiveness, therefore, for serious crime, and fear of being shot by a police officer as major contributors to their lack of their neighborhood safety. Um, they also described an overall sense that the police were a negative force in their communities, and they sensed a lack of care for people in the community. They also drew a direct connection between the way they were treated as less than human and their race. Um, and these young people helped craft recommendations, and they included things like bringing services to youth, hiring more credible messengers, but also engage, engaging crew leadership as potentially pro-social movements within a community. Um, so I just kind of want to leave with us on the idea that we really need to listen to young people, the same people that are being labeled and scapegoated by the police and prosecutors, because we really can't rely on progressive prosecutors to save the day. Thank you, MK. So I am Professor Babe Howell. I uh, teach at the City University of New York, CUNY, and I have been studying gang policing, particularly in New York, where it's known as Stop and Frisk 2.0. New York didn't historically uh, surveil and abuse kids based on the gang label, but since the Stop and Frisk case found that they were uh, violating both the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment by racially profiling black and brown for stop and frisk, they pivoted to add this label, which then covers up all wrongdoing, as far as we can tell. And the gang database, as MK said, is 99% black and brown. Um, we've heard so far from three uh, practitioners talking about local, local elected prosecutors and prosecutors who claim they're progressive. Unfortunately, that does not safeguard against harsh gang prosecutions. Uh, hopefully someday it might. Um, and I'm going to turn to the role of federal prosecutors and discuss that role for a bit. As a roadmap, first I'll talk about why federal prosecutors who prosecute only a small portion of criminal cases are so important to decriminalizing neighborhoods. Second, I'll share my research on the Bronx 120 gang takedown, the biggest gang takedown in New York history. I'll use that to demonstrate how federal prosecutors can abuse RICO and other federal laws and deceive the public about gang issues. Third, I'll talk about the complete failure of the criminal system to take into account either society's responsibility for the extreme vulnerability of most gang members or their extraordinary resilience. So turning to the first issue, uh, the importance of federal prosecutors. Uh, so far, progressive prosecutors have let us down, but it's still a very promising route. We heard from uh, Chesa Boudin this morning who says, I'm, I'm implementing a, a presumption against gang uh, enhancements. We can imagine a world where the uh, move towards decarceration and abolition may lead progressive prosecutors, elected prosecutors, to reject gang enhancements and gang allegations. If they do, however, federal prosecutors can simply sweep in and prosecute or even re-prosecute people who have served state sentences. They can re-prosecute people who have been diverted from the system or are successful in alternatives to incarceration. People who are successful in trauma-informed restorative justice approaches. Even people who have been acquitted or had cases dismissed. The Federal Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organization Act or RICO as it's known has become a vehicle 
for the harshest and most unfair prosecutions of alleged gang members. These prosecutions allow for the repeat punishment and, and even the elevation of misdemeanor conduct to federal RICO felonies. Although RICO was designed to target sophisticated white collar criminals and organized crime such as the mafia, it has been increasingly used to target ordinary gangs, crews, and neighborhood peer groups. For decades, under Democratic and Republican administrations, federal prosecutors have expanded their role in prosecuting ordinary local crime and undermining local juries and prosecutors with these tough on crime approaches. Not only do they use RICO laws, but also federal drug laws, gun laws, and capital punishment. Because of these powerful laws, local police, the ones that MK and, uh, and Meredith have been talking about, can circumvent pr progressive elected prosecutors and they can avoid sympathetic juries, juries who may know their reputations by name because you're a Bronx cop who abuses child after child. That jury knows they're not gonna trust you, but they can go straight to the non-elected federal prosecutors to pursue these same neighborhood groups and they do so with increasing frequency. So federal prosecutors are critical actors that we need to think about as we uh, think about how we would decriminalize neighborhood association. Which brings me to my second point. To explore the role of the progressive federal prosecutor, I'll focus on the particular gang case known as the Bronx 120. It involved a takedown, a militarized raid with tanks, helicopters, SWAT teams, battering rams, 700 local and federal uh, law enforcement, breaking down the doors of dozens of Bronx homes and arresting 120 uh, young people, almost all black and all male, and almost all male. At a press conference the morning of this raid, Preet Bharara, who is the darling of some liberal Americans for getting fired by President Trump, who was then the US attorney for the Southern District of New York appointed by Barack Obama, he announced that the Bronx 120 indictments involved, and I quote, 120 defendants in two rival Bronx street gangs. He said, again, a quote, that these groups had for years terrorized the neighborhood. These statement, statements were not true and they were deeply misleading. I found this out by reviewing the court documents and particularly the government's own submissions in the Bronx 120 case. And I found that about half of the 120 defendants were not even members of either of the two crews that were targeted. They weren't alleged to be members of any gangs and they weren't alleged to be member of these crews. So let me repeat, 60 people were brought in at dawn with tanks and helicopters. And the media press release and conferences labeled them all violent gang members who terrorized their neighborhoods and they were not even gang members, nor had they been terrorizing their neighborhoods. Two thirds of them had no felony convictions. No felony conviction whatsoever, much less a violent one. 30 of them had no record whatsoever a hundred of them were not convicted of, of any gun possession, much, much less use. So you are labeling a hundred people who grew up in the most heavily policed neighborhood at the peak of stop and frisk policing. When 60 of them are not gang members, 80 of them have no prior felony records and many of them have no records whatsoever. Moreover, we talked about repeat prosecution. In this case, the kids who were involved in the worst violence were not out terrorizing the neighborhood. They were typically already in jail or prison, having been adjudicated or going through adjudication in the state system. Nonetheless, 120 people, almost all of them black and male, were arrested in the Bronx and charged with conduct that took place between 2007 and 2016. Their constitutional rights, as Professor Hayat pointed out, did not protect them. A hundred of, of the 120 were denied bail 
Even the few who, who were given bail were put under house arrest or electronic monitoring. These are people who don't have records, who were heavily policed, who were supposedly surveilled for a decade. Uh, speedy trial rights were suspended and double jeopardy just does not apply to these uh, prosecutions. Uh, uh, something we can explain in question and answer. Folks aren't familiar with those ideas. 112 of them, even though many of them were charged with say selling marijuana, which is, was a misdemeanor and is legalized now, uh, were forced to plead to federal felonies Two went to trial and they were convicted based on cooperator testimony and the testimony of NYPD officers with history of racist conduct. Um, to, so to sum up, federal prosecutors were turning state misdemeanors into federal felonies years after the fact. They were re-prosecuting shootings by defendants who were serving or had served state sentences and obtaining new federal felony convictions and additional time. There's not a lot that can surprise me in terms of what happens in the criminal system, but I was surprised that 60 non-gang members were brought in a gang takedown. I was surprised that 100 of these people were not involved with violence. Um, I shouldn't have been, but the progressive federal prosecutor with his huge media uh, reach is reaching out and telling people that folks are gang members, that they are violent and they are terrorizing their neighborhoods. And that really perpetuates uh, raci ra racist um, biases and, and stereotypes in our society. And it is entirely unwarranted. More importantly too, the criminal system is for criminals. So even if you are a gang member, whether you're a gang member or not, if you committed a crime, you should still have fair process. And this label denied them of this, of the fair process. But for my last point, I do want to talk about how these cases vilify the most vulnerable in our society. In an article on the morality of punishing people who experience extreme deprivation in our society, Richard Delgado, a legal scholar, wrote, society's failure to consider carefully a defense of severe environmental deprivation says many things about us, not all of them pleasant. It means principally that we are willing to make double victims of people. We first tolerate the deplorable conditions in which many of them are born and grow up. Then when they predictably offend, we punish them a second time. In the gang RICO cases, we allow triple punishment and more. We not only tolerate the deplorable conditions, but the government is seen again and again exacerbating these conditions. Um, it's no secret that the criminal justice system does not take into account hardships in assessing criminal liability, but the gang cases place this practice, practice in a more glaring light. First, these individuals were pulled into the case for relying on peer group and friend networks for family, for support, for economic opportunity. Their peer group became more central because their families were dismantled by the government, by deportation, by incarceration, by failure to provide mental health and substance abuse supports. The same government that has un underfunded schools, shelters and public benefits that locked up and deported their family members that failed to clean up lead paint in the housing they lived in is prosecuting these individuals because of their association with neighborhood peer groups. So second, uh, these defendants also did demonstrate remarkable resilience, but the RICO charge, the gang charge, allowed the government to look back over nine years and pick out particular unlawful acts and disregard all their other accomplishments. And once again, it was the continuing relation with the peer group that anchored the claim that they were somehow part of an ongoing criminal enterprise. So the prosecutor doesn't just uh, punish people for a second time when they, when they offend, but they often will 
punish them for a third time. They do not acknowledge when individuals have already uh, paid their debts to society to the extent they owed that they were owed any, and they never recognize uh, what society may owe to these vulnerable individuals. So on that note, um, I'd like to open things up for question and answer. And I'm sorry, I think I did go over time because I forgot to hit go. And for anyone who's interested in kind of the Bronx 120 information, I put a link into the uh, chat. And let's see what questions we have. Anyone can take them on. So there's one question here that I, I think may have been in uh, response to what I was saying about the gatekeeping by police and prosecutors to alternatives to incarceration. Um, so for people who do receive a GPS or, or phone, or I'm sorry, GPS monitoring, um, ankle monitors while they're out pending trial, um, yes, we, we have every reason to believe that that information is added to the criminal group database. Um, you know, this is a state surveillance mechanism that's placed on their person um, and then it's uploaded into a state database and there's no reason that we should believe that that's not used to bolster the criminal group database or the gang database. Um, we believe that any information that's available to the state is being used to build those networks to create cases against people. Um, there was, you know, there are efforts uh, to encourage people to file freedom of information requests about their own information into the database, but unfortunately the NYPD often denies them, um, citing ongoing investigations. So we have limited insight into exactly what is in, contained in the database, but certainly we believe that any access that the state has given to a person's whereabouts um, are being used to build their files that the NYPD keeps on them. I also want to make a follow-up comment that uh, oftentimes in um, these gang cases, especially advocates that are always talking about the innocent are those who are accused of being gang members as opposed to those who are actually gang members, those who are actually committing crimes. And especially in my writing, um, I really believe that it's important to assert that these constitutional rights and this concept of fairness should apply to those people as well. Really building on this concept of if we can provide um, just representation and like uh, 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 equality to the most despised, it certainly will spread across to everyone else. So it's not that um, people don't commit crimes and that gang violence is not something serious and horrible within our communities. But these are largely very poor people with very few resources. And if police, number one, did their job correctly, or number two, if our resources were shifted to get on the front end instead of prosecuting, um, I'm doing some research right now where we find that in Los Angeles County, they're spending around $118,000 per year for each gang member to prosecute and put into jail. $118,000 per person, over $1.8 billion for 40,000 gang members or so. And this concept that we would spend so much money to punish, as opposed to simply spending some of that money with this concept of redistributing uh, 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 or, uh, or um, defunding police or moving toward this kind of abolitionist agenda to say, let's put this money in a way that we can avoid the problem so we don't have these more serious complications. And then the last note, I would say this concept of the despised people, we are easily able to extend, if we're gonna limit gang members' rights, then we're gonna turn and say, we're gonna limit immigrants' rights. We're gonna uh, limit Muslim rights. We're gonna, we're gonna continue to choose who's not entitled to the protections of our constitution. And I think that that is fundamentally problematic. I'm seeing a question about RICO and it being uh, designed to target uh, sophisticated organizations and therefore federal prosecutors should get more funding to, to deal with it. Um, I think thinking about RICO is important and to the extent we can have a, a progressive decarceral agenda or one at least that says, hey, neighborhood groups of kids 
this was not the point of RICO. We could imagine relatively um, uh, reasonable kind of jurisdictional requirements added to RICO. So at a minimum, you need to show an impact of you know one million dollars in this uh, on the uh, interstate or or on the interstate um, commerce within a year or six months. You know, one thing they managed to do is they say, well, this 100 people over the course of a decade would have brought in X number of kilos. So they managed to, to pile up like, you know, selling nickel and dime bags adds up to something jurisdictional, but you could make a, a limit that would kind of push RICO back into the original uh, con confines that were imagined. There's been case law that says the effect on interstate commerce only needs to be de minimis. And that is what opened the floodgates to RICO charges against gang members. Going to Farid's point about gang members um, versus non-gang members, I can't agree more. It, it's very, it's almost annoying to me that 60 of these people were not in the crew because I really wanna focus on anyone alleged to be in a crew or a gang should have a fair trial. And that fair trial, as Fareed says, shouldn't even include that they are a gang member. You know, that's evidence 101, propensity evidence. You can't bring in that all my friends are, are, are not so cool. And one of the other issues about gang members that many of you probably know is there are kind of core gang members and there are more marginal hangers on and mostly people join gangs for protection, not in order to join a conspiracy to go hurt people. So it's really a world where um, we shouldn't be using these allegations because they are so powerful and so powerfully prejudicial that it means you just cannot have a fair trial. I want to also respond to this concept of RICO being designed for some highly sophisticated organizations. And um, I know that's kind of like the legislative history. And you know, um, this is what they say. But when you really like uh, um, dig into these, uh, I'm writing a paper right now where I'm digging into the legislative history and the people who created the California Step Act, which was the first gang statute in this country. And what I'm finding is that these people were actually engaged in racist ideology and practice for quite a long time. And that the gang statute that they say, hey, we're going after these sophisticated gangs that are causing all these problems are really tied to quintessential badges of slavery or black codes. You have um, someone like Kenneth Hahn or uh, James Hahn, who was the city attorney at the time, or Ira Reiner, who was the county attorney at the time, who say outright, these people are not entitled to constitutional rights. You have uh, um, Daryl Gates, who uses all kinds of racist uh, uh, language and outright statements about um, um, the fact that individuals from these communities are undeserving of these rights. Um, you have uh, um, uh, Robbins, who was the state legislator who led a campaign against busing in California and has all this very racist ideology who then shifts to gang, uh, gang prosecutions and like we get on board with him, even though he's already shown that he's anti-Black, he was anti-busing. And his ideology to support that was very much not progressive. So I, I think that um, what we do know is the people who are prosecuted under these statutes are poor. They, um, all of us are public defenders. We're the people representing gang members. It's very rare that gang members are showing up with that high-powered lawyer. Well, I would like to consider myself a high-powered lawyer nonetheless of being a public servant, but you know, no one's paying me $100,000 for their representation. And that's the, in the case that I did where it was over 40 defendants, not one person had a private attorney, though they're alleging they're moving millions of dollars of drugs. Well, where is all this money so they can hire their representation? So uh, I would push back on the need for more resources to be used. I think just getting back down to basic police work instead of uh, uh, um, trying to get a conviction without actually simply sitting outside and doing some investigation, um, we don't need more resources. We need more diligence. And kind of building on all these discussions, I mean, 
several of these prosecutors, I, I don't think uh, Preet Bharara ever claimed to be progressive, progressive or decarceral, um, but many of them really do claim to be decarceral, but then they just accept the narratives from the police. I think oftentimes because they feel like they don't have the expertise that the police know the neighborhoods, that they are trying to protect these communities. Uh, but it is incredibly pernicious. And it's something that if we are looking for progressive prosecutors, if we're looking for reform, we really need people who understand this piece too and say we will not cr criminalize neighborhood peer associations. We will look for alternatives that don't involve the police. Driving down your block, as MK says, announcing where you're from, which is what New York alternatives are, you know, uh, that address these issues outside the criminal justice system. And I will never, ever add one minute of time or even allow my prosecutors to bring those allegations into court. And I won't let the police come do it either, as Meredith was pointing out. You know, they come in and are and testify in these ways that are just, yeah, bringing racism straight into the classroom. In these gang cases that, uh, in the two trial cases that went to trial in the um, Bronx 120, one of the officers who testified, his Twitter handle was Obama Hater 55. Um, and in the other, the uh, the cop had cost you know upwards of a quarter million dollars in uh, in police misconduct um, violate 1983 civil rights violations, and these are the police officers who are coming in as the experts and explaining what all these thugs in the community are doing. Uh, seven minutes from now, we'll move to the Kumo space. I'm going to shut up and let other people talk. I kind of wanted to um, piggyback off of what you were saying, babe, regarding how we need progressive prosecutors in this particular area to look for alternatives um, for services for these individuals that are outside the police department. Um, and I would just know being in one of the jurisdictions where, you know, we have one of the most famous progressive prosecutors who gets in the media and says, frequently that he understands the importance of jobs, he understands the importance of social services, and he's really working with the city to be able to provide those, um, that that's not enough, right? We have to look at if they're actually backing up what they're saying. So in, I think Philadelphia is a good example. One of the issues before Krasner came was that our district attorney was making all these claims about social services that long story short, did not pan out and the social services director actually ended up quitting because he would get written up if he tried to support these individuals in court who were taking advantage of social services. Um, in regards to Krasner, I listened to one of his talks the other day where he testified to city council about how they were putting community liaisons in every police district and how those community liaisons were going to connect these individuals who were, who they had identified as, um, you know, more likely than other individuals to be sh targets of shootings or to shoot so that therefore they could connect them to services and offer them a way out of this lifestyle. So I went to the police, the first police district where these community liaisons were supposed to be. I asked to speak to the community liaison. They looked at me like I had three heads. They had no idea what I was talking about. So the next day I called because maybe I, I thought, you know, maybe he just wasn't working that day or I talked to the wrong people, whatever. Eventually somebody was able to lead me to this community liaison who was a police officer. And that police officer, I talked to him and asked him, you know, what community organizations do you partner with? He's like, I don't partner with any community organizations. I work in the 18th district and that's it. It's like, okay, so walk me through, what do you do as community liaison? He said he walks up, he gets a list from the city of individuals who are supposed to be targeted for these programs, goes to those individuals' houses, knocks on the door and says, hey, do you wanna participate in social services? If you do, there are social services for you. Here's number you can call. And then he leaves. So then I asked him, okay, well, what social services are available? I don't know. Well, do you know if any social services are available? No, I don't. Like, okay, so Krasner had testified about this to city council that this was their program and this is how it panned out. My error, and this is what I found out. And so in addition, like his lip service 
is great. And if you listen to him talk, and I'm sure other progressive prosecutors talk, it might sound great, like they're on board with everything that we're saying. But if you don't ask the people on the ground who actually know what's being implemented, who know where the resources are going, then we really don't know anything, right? They could be telling the truth, but they could not. And so I just wanted to, yeah. I just wanted to say, like, in, in response to that, there are programs that work, you know, in Los Angeles, there's a homeboy bakery. And the homeboy bakery focuses on formerly incarcerated, specifically former um, people who are gang members. And what they show is they're going from a 70% recidivism rate across the board, where um, um, normal defendants who get released are getting locked back up at 70%, and they can bring it down to like 19%. But the homeboy bakery don't have enough resources to bring in everyone who's being released. So instead of paying that officer this extra salary to be the community liaison, we actually have organizations out there that have the resources that are not about partial alternative um, incarceration and would do the work and have a track record of being successful. If we're concerned about safety and concerned about gang violence, let's address it with resources. And I raised my hand just because I did see some some of my students on this call, and I just love the way that Meredith like asked cops questions. So many times people think like they're not going to talk to me. A lot of times they will, you know, walk up to them after a hearing and ask them a bunch of questions. Um, you will learn a lot and um, it could really help with advocacy. Same with complaining witnesses, anyone else, like you wanna know what's happening, don't be shy. Sorry, that's a, that's a teacher aside, but I couldn't help it. And going on to the point of uh, Fareed's point though, there's quite, there are quite a few sessions here about uh, alternatives. And it is really, really, really important to focus on this because there are huge, commitments to kind of moving, you know, claiming some, something's an alternative, putting it into ceasefire, putting police officers and prosecutors in charge of the exit lanes. And those exit lanes are really kind of like the ones that go off and come back in like a, a mile up the road. It's, it's highly um, pathologized. Rest stops. Impossible. Yeah, like a rest stop. Exactly. Like we're going to give you a, a detour for a quarter mile. Okay, I think there's, I am the volunteer for the next session, but I will leave in a few minutes to start the next session. Okay. I just want just to add to that, we've been calling a couple of the programs that are offered in Brooklyn, their deferred incarceration programs. Um, you know, because they will let people in, but they, they make it impossible to succeed, to graduate. You know, their, their terms are things like you must no longer associate with any known gang members and that, you know, who the known gang member is, it was of course up to the NYPD. But what if it's your dad and that's where you live? Um, you know, and if that doesn't change overnight, then they're failed out and they're sent upstate. And so we do refer to them as deferred incarceration because that's really what it is. You take the plea up front, you get into this ATI and then you inevitably fail. Um, so it's just not working. And I think that's largely because police and prosecutors still control the process. And the release terms too of the, the a lot of the Bronx 120, because they hadn't really done anything, got time served, but often after months in jail. But the release was like, plus you can't associate with anyone in your crew. It's like, these are the people I grew up with who live on my block, in my building, on my floor for my whole life. Um, I see a question in the, um, in the chat that's asking specifically about collateral estoppel, double jeopardy, and those kind of arguments. Um, um, Brenda, do you want to ask that question and maybe we can try to answer it for you? I think we have to move into the other space, so maybe answer there. Okay. I don't know if we have to move or not. I, I you are welcome. Oh, sorry. Sorry, on the volunteer. Uh, you're welcome to stay here. I just need to transfer the host duty to one of you all, so oh. if that's preferred. Or um, we invite everyone to move to the Kumo space as well. Why don't we just stay here, right? Or do we want to go to Kumo space? Maybe we can at least try to address Brandon's question first. Let's we'll address Brandon's question, and then we'll go to Kumo space. Jacqueline, why don't you make for read the boss now? <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Oh, so 
So who wants to address this question about the double jeopardy? So, um, Brandon, you know, I, I guess the first thing is, uh, 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 of course, we have like the supremacy clause. If it is a RICO uh, indictment and it's a federal prosecutor bringing the charge for something that you've already been found not guilty of, then uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has said over and over again that that's permissible. Now, I personally disagree um, that that's not a violation of double jeopardy because the double jeopardy clause is pretty clear you know same offense is the same offense not who is the party bringing the charge um but our law allows them to bring that the problem i think in terms of a state prosecution is a little different because it is the exact same party bringing the charge and um our same offense analysis works pretty straightforward that if there's no new elements um, from um, the gang charge and the um, substantive charge. I'll give a simple example of like drug distribution. If you're charged with drug distribution on behalf of the gang, you number one have to fulfill all the elements of the gang prosecution. Two or three members who made an agreement to commit a crime and uh, uh, in furtherance of the gang, and it has to have an enumerated crime. Well, if that crime is drug distribution, so then you have to fulfill all the elements of drug distribution meaning actual drug distributing to another person, all right? So those are the elements of the gang prosecution for drug distribution. Well, what are the elements for drug distribution? The actual drugs and giving it to another person. There is no different element on the drug side. So as a result, that drug charge falls under a complete, it is completely incorporated into the gang charge. So that's why it's a violation of double jeopardy within the uh, uh, simultaneous prosecution on um, bait. Yeah, but that almost never happens. See, what they typically do is say, uh, so there's two ways of getting around double jeopardy. One is a different sovereign. You know, I, I can bring a state case in federal court. I can bring, bring a federal case in state court. And sometimes we like to see that. Rodney King was acquitted. They brought it in in fed not rodney king but the the cops who beat beat him up they brought it in federal court um the same more or less the same facts definitely the same facts slightly different charges they can also add a different element as fadid points out what usually happens with a kind of you know okay i made the mistake of charging to just the one distribution before is the prosecutor just gets smart and he puts on one of his cooperators to say, he sold drugs with us all the time. You know, like this other day I got it. That's what I saw in the Bronx cases. Like this one guy who was not a gang member went to trial um, and said like, I sold weed for myself. And they were saying, he's not a gang member. He's an associate. He sold to them at a discount. And they use cops in two like marijuana cases who couldn't even remember the case. You know, that was seven years ago or six years ago in cases where he'd done a community day of community service or something. But they brought in NYPD to say, like, I arrested him on this day with 10 bags of marijuana. I arrested him on this day with, you know, three bags of marijuana and $20. And then they brought in the cooperator to say he was uh, he sold to us at a discount. And that enhanced our reputation. And the, the cooperators added on different days. So they added like this conspiracy, uh, the extra element was more distribution than the two unique moments. So they can pretty much get around it by using that sort of um, testimony of cooperators who will say so-and-so did all sorts of crap on different days. And, and the, the police testimony like anchors and you've already pled guilty to those cases often too. So you got no defense against, yeah, I sold weed, but you're just fighting with uh, these guys who are like, I belong to the worst gang ever and you can't, and you know, and the, the prosecutors get them to say like, you can't um, sell drugs in our neighborhood unless you have a deal with the crews, which in New York is not how things work. I think we better move to the Kumo space though. And I, I hope that explains it, but essentially that like the double, je we need to keep challenging double jeopardy because I think the old white slave owners who wrote the constitution would be 
rolling over in their grave about how double jeopardy is, is interpreted, maybe. But, I, but I, I will say, like, I agree if they have you with multiple instances of um, selling drugs, then, you know, they can, you won't have a, uh, a collateral stop issue. But, you know, it, it's more often than not that you can, they can have you with one instance. And that one instance, you've already been found not guilty of. And the fact is that the statute is written where it says that we can bring this same charge that you've already been found not guilty of even though we don't have any more. 